Hello everyone out there from Emmanuel Lutheran Church and beyond. Pastor Rob Eller here. Once again, apologies for the lack of a live stream today. We're having some difficulties with our Amiibo camera and the app on our tablet that controls it. We hope by next week we'll have it figured out. But in the meantime, here is a abbreviated service for you. With some, and we'll start with some announcements. Today is the organ concert at 3 p.m. So please come on out and join us. We're collecting a free will offering for the organ fund. It should be a good time. We'll have a half dozen musicians. We are still doing shoe boxes for, op for uh, Operation Christmas Child. Those are due back on November 12th. This Wednesday is our last pub theology of the year. We're going to take the next couple months off just because of the holiday rush and all that with November, December. We thought it'd be best to take a break and then reconvene after this month in January. Those are all the announcements I have for this morning. Let us begin with the prayer of the day. Let us pray. Sovereign God, raise your throne in our hearts. Created by you, let us live in your image. Created for you, let us act as your glory. Redeemed by you, let us give you what is yours. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The first lesson is from the 45th chapter of Isaiah. Thus says the Lord to his anointed to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped to subdue nations before him and strip kings of their robes, to open doors before him, and the gates shall not be closed. I will go before you and level the mountains. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and riches hidden in secret places, so you may know what it, know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel my chosen, I call you by your name. I surname you, though you do not know me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me there is no God. I arm you, though you do not know me, so that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is no one besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make weal and create woe. I, the Lord, do all these things. The Word of the Lord. The second lesson is from the first chapter of 1 Thessalonians. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, Grace and peace to you. We always give thanks to God for all you, all of you, and mention you in our prayers constantly, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, beloved by God, that he has chosen you, because our message of the gospel came to you not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction just as you know what kind of persons we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For in spite of persecution, you received the word with joy and inspired by the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place your faith in God has become known so that we have no need to speak about it. For the people of those regions report about us what, ki what kind of welcoming we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols, to serve a living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who rescues us from the wrath that is coming. The Word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 22nd chapter. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap Jesus in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere, and teach the way of God in accordance with truth, and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us, then, what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. 
and they brought him a Daenerys. Then he said to them, Whose head is this and whose title? They answered, The Emperor's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the Emperor the things that are the Emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. The Gospel of the Lord. Whose face is on the one dollar bill? George Washington's. All of our cur current currency features the faces of deceased presidents or people that played a large impact in the founding of this country, like Alexander Hamilton and Benjamin Franklin. This isn't a uniquely American phenomenon. Many other countries will put their leader's face, whether past or present, on their currency. Notably, the UK and many of their Commonwealth countries will put the monarch's face on all of the currency, which for more than 50 years was Queen Elizabeth, and is now transitioning to King Charles. While it is seen by many as a sign of respect or commemoration for those leaders, to some though it becomes problematic, because it can be seen as a form of idol worship. The first commandment is, You shall have no other gods before me, and you shall not make a graven image. When we start to look upon our leaders past and present in the same light as God and we start to worship them, it becomes very problematic. Most of you know that I'm a history buff and a former history teacher. Let me pull out an example of this from the Annals of History. In the early days of the Roman Empire, there, there lived a devout Christian named Maximus. Maximus was not only a devout follower of Jesus, but also a respected citizen of the empire. He was known for his integrity, kindness, and unwavering faith. He had been appointed a, as a local magistrate, a position of considerable influence and responsibility. One day, an imperial decree arrived in Maximus' city. The decree demanded that every citizen must offer a pinch of incense to the statue of the Roman emperor, a symbolic act of worship and loyalty. Those who refused to do so would face severe consequences, including persecution, imprisonment, or even death. Maximus faced a difficult decision. As a civic leader, he was expected to set an example and enforce the emperor's decree. But as a Christian, he knew that he could not bow down to any idol or emperor. He wrestled with this dilemma and spent many sleepless nights in prayer. One day Maximus gathered the people of his city in the town square and spoke from his heart. He said, I am a loyal citizen of this great empire, and I have a deep love for my fellow citizens. However, my first allegiance is to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. I cannot and will not offer incense to any man or idol. I choose to put God's, put God above all earthly leaders. Maximus's decision shook the city. Some admired his unwavering faith, while others saw it as an act of rebellion. The authorities arrested him and brought him before the local governor. The governor, aware of Maximus's reputation, tried to persuade him to reconsider, but Maximus ref remained resolute. As a consequence, he faced persecution, imprisonment, and even torture. But through it all, his faith never wavered. He continued to pray, to encourage his fellow prisoners, and to put God above all else. His story inspired many, and even some among the Roman authorities were moved by his unwavering faith. This ties right into our gospel lesson for today. One of the issues that Jesus had to contend with during his ministry was that the People of the Roman Empire believed that Caesar was a god and that he should be worshipped. Everything that was done for the empire was also done for Caesar. In the last few weeks, we have had readings where the Pharisees were trying to trap Jesus so that they had grounds to arrest him. And each time, Jesus had been able to turn the tables on the Pharisees and instead trap them and make them think more about where they stand. However, the Pharisees are getting craftier, and this time they send their followers, along with some Herodians. Herodians are followers of King Herod, the puppet king of Judea that the Roman Empire had installed to keep the peace and placate the Judeans' desire to have their own ruler. Herod was really a king in name only. He was there to do the bidding of Rome, even if it violated laws and customs of Judea. 
So today they think they have the perfect trap. A way to get Jesus to publicly denounce the emperor, which would get him into lots of trouble. They approach with false praise in order for him to let his guard down and ask whether it is lawful, according to scripture, for Judeans to be paying taxes to the emperor. If Jesus answers yes, then they can accuse him of contradicting his own teaching on true loyalty to God alone. However, if he says no, then that would make him anti, an anti-imperial revolutionary. They expected Jesus to say, you give everything to God, so how could you give to the empire if, if there's nothing left? Jesus sees right through their ruse and gets very upset with them. Why are you coming to me with this test, you bunch of hypocrites? Putting someone to the test like this, especially Jesus, was a wrong move. It can be seen as evil because it only serves to entrap him. Calling them hypocrites just adds more salt to that wound because as they were followers of the Pharisees, they should know the answer already. Jesus then asked for a coin and asked whose head was on it, to which they answered, Caesar's. This is where we get the famous verse, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the thing that are, things that are God's. In other words, that money came from the empire, therefore you give it back to the empire. What belongs to God is what matters most. Jesus was trying to emphasize that the empire should not be conflated with the kingdom of heaven, and St. Paul emphasized that as well in his first letter to the church in Thessalonica. Thessalonica was a provincial capital in the empire, and by that time, their coins had Caesar's face on them, and they referred to him as God, and the current emperor Claudius as the son of God. Paul praised the people for staying true to their faith, despite the persecution they were sure to face. Now, this isn't to say that the leaders of the world are separate from the work of the kingdom. They can and do play a major part. In our first reading from Isaiah, we are introduced to King Cyrus of Persia, an unlikely hero figure in the story of the Babylonian exile. God has seen that the Israelites had suffered long enough and wanted them to go home. To do this would require an action of large proportions because it would not be easy. It would require something as powerful as Babylon to make it happen. God didn't just appoint Cyrus as the person to shepherd the Israelites back home. He anointed him. This has major implications because that imagery is also what Isaiah used to describe the suffering servant, whom we have regarded today as Jesus. Cyrus was chosen because he was well regarded as someone who respected the different ethnic populations of the areas he ruled and had respect for their different religions. God was effectively saying, this person is not of you, but he respects you and cares for you and will help lead you back to the land that I gave you. We cannot let the world draw us away from God. We might be tempted to think that those in power should be put on a pedestal and held in the same regard as God, but they aren't. But they are, however, our tools to bring about the kingdom of heaven. Much like how Cyrus was used by God to free the Israelites from the Babylonian exile. It was because of the respect Cyrus had for others which led him to being anointed by God for such a great task. When we have that same level of care and respect for those who are different than us, think about the kind of work we can do in the world. We can bring about real change for the betterment of all people. When we give back to God what God entrusted us with, we can make a real and lasting difference in the world. Sometimes we, need, we will need help doing this work, and that help can come from some very unexpected places, at least from places we're not used to. It could be two rival schools joining forces to raise money for a local charity, a tattoo parlor collecting canned goods for the food pantry, among many others. One image that sticks with me comes from the Arab Spring protests from 10 years ago, when Coptic Christians in Egypt protected Muslims during daily prayer, and those Muslims doing the same for Christians during daily Mass. When we remember who it is we serve, who it is we worship, 
give praise and thanksgiving to, we will remember why we do these things. We can never lose sight of this. We can never lose sight of why we're Christians. Our faith is what informs our lives. It's what makes us who we are. And when we spread that faith through our actions and our love, we can truly make a difference. And we can truly make this world a much better place. And all of God's people said, Amen. Thank you for joining us today for this abbreviated worship. Again, apologies for the live stream not working. We will try to get it fixed. It's just a lot of technical stuff to get through. God's peace be with all of you out there. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have a blessed day, everyone.